All right. Um, it's three minutes past one. I think maybe we should start. What do you think? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm fine. So. Yes. So, um, hello everyone. Welcome to the second webinar in our series of Global Labor Organization Virtual Young Scholar Program webinars. We have overall three webinars planned. We have already had our first one last week and you can see recordings from that webinar on the GLO Vertis webpage. Um, for those of you who have joined us for the first time, the GLO Vertis program was established last year and we have had seven scholars who worked on their proposed research papers within several GLO clusters uh, with the advice provided by the GLO cluster leaders in many cases and um, sometimes other GLO cluster members. Um, today's webinar brings here two young scholars. Dr. Satyendra Kumar Gupta from India and Mr. Hel Kelly Hyde from, Univers um, from USA. I will uh, introduce them a little bit later, but before doing that, let me uh, mention uh, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded, so in case that may, have, may affect your decision to turn on or off the video, um, I would like uh, you to know that it's being recorded uh, and the content similar to the first webinar will be put online and you can access it and share with your colleagues uh, if you find this interesting. Each presentation will take 15 minutes followed by a 10 minute discussion and given these time restrictions, I suggest that we keep the, uh, the questions to the discussion, but um, in order not to forget, please feel free to type in your question into the chat box below. Um, we are a little bit experimenting in terms of the setup of the webinar to move it kind of closer to um, uh, environment that we may have in our regular seminar series in the university. So this time it's not like a webinar setup. Uh, that you can raise your hand, but there will be like more discussion, open discussion later on, so you could unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. But for the time being, for the presentations, please uh, mute your microphone um, if you are not speaking. So without further ado, let me introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Satyendra Gupta. Uh, whose GLO Vertis advisor has been Professor Almos Heshmati. Satyendra is an assistant professor at the Jindal Global University in India, School of Government and Public Policy, and he will present to you his GLO Vertis project on irrigation and culture, exploring the gender roles and women rights dimension of this question. Uh, please, the screen is yours, Satyendra. Thank you. Well, this is a joint work with the uh, PAR. And uh, let me just move this, sorry. Okay. My mic is not working, okay. So, well, the motivation behind this project uh, is based on some of the historical, uh, the papers that use the history or experience from the past where, uh, where the researchers have tried to explain how some of the events in the history can explain contemporary social or economic outcomes. Some of the, the outcomes that has been identified or uh, are important are like trust, gender roles, culture, or income level. So, and out in this literature, there is one particular uh, field that looks at, uh, so I just, uh, this, I'm just minimizing the photos. It's coming on my slide. Okay, sorry. So out of uh, in this field, there is a subfield that looks at uh, the experience of uh, agriculture and some natural endowment and how it can uh, uh, explain our uh, contemporary outcomes. For example, either conflict or individualism or female labor force participation. Then uh, there are some 
uh, there is some literature that looks at uh, the resource uh, curves and where people have used uh, resource like mines, diamonds, oil, and gas, and irrigation uh, to some extent. And in this paper, basically, we will be using irrigation. Okay. Okay. Um, this uh, looking at the gender roles is important because uh, this gender inequality can affect uh, the female rights, income, and welfare of the current generation, and also it can affect the children's education and the welf their welfare as well. So, if there is some inequality in the current generation, it can be passed on to the next generation and it can persist in the society. So it becomes important to understand why and how this gender inequality comes or comes into the social, uh, uh, becomes a part of culture and people uh, use it or perpetuate it. Then uh, another uh, variable that has been used in the in the literature is uh, Neolithic revolution that's related to again agriculture or the use of plow. So these are few of the variables that have been used in the uh, in the past. In this uh, study, as I said earlier, we are looking at uh, how irrigation can explain the gender roles in society. Why we are looking at irrigation? Well, uh, if you look at on the left hand diagram with the, the colors. It shows that uh, irrigation is uh, is used across the world. Uh, and this is uh, a diagram from uh, the recent past. And if you look at on the um, on the right hand side picture, then it shows the how whether or not the irrigation was used in the societies in the past. And if you look at the the red dots that basically indicate the whether a society was using irrigation or not, then it uh, we can find that the irrigation was used across the world. Well, sorry. Then there are a few uh, observations that I would like to highlight about irrigation. Then. The irrigation is uh, something that pushed towards the muscle power in a society because uh, of few reasons like uh, irrigation is an infrastructure that needs to be protected from your neighbors and the upstream farmers. And uh, once people are using irrigation in agriculture, the agriculture becomes more intensive and there are more storable uh, output that people would like to protect from uh, the neighbors or people who could attack and would like to take it away. So it basically necessitates that there is muscle power in society. Then also it creates a division of labor because uh, traditionally what has been, uh, has been found in literature is that generally males, they capture the technology and they enjoy the benefit of increase of product because of any kind of technology. Then also at the same time, the females are pushed into the activities that are close to the home or at home in particular. Then it, this can also create uh, private property rights. And uh, if what happens with irrigation is also that uh, it creates a culture of elites or autocracy, and that basically uh, creates the insecure property rights or it has been also found recently that uh, it can also create a culture of collectivism where because the, in agriculture people are working together and it can create a culture of collectivism in the society and that it has also been found that the collectivism is is associated with the traditional gender roles and traditional gender roles have been uh, not in favor of equality so using all this uh, 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 the literature we have hypothesized in this paper that irrigation can yield gender bias and that affects the labor market outcome and gender attitude in particular. The independent variable in this study that has been used is the irrigation potential that uh, we have taken from a paper by Janet Manchin uh, and it has been developed using uh, FAO data and uh, I will just uh, highlight a few things. Uh, if you, what happens, what this 
variables basically tells is when if you can use irrigation in a particular uh, area then how much the productivity of agriculture will increase using the irrigation th that particular area so that increase that you can also see with the uh, is shows here that class impact class one there's a zero percent increase that's with the green and if you look at the, the red that's the impact class five where the the increase in productivity can be more than 100 percent if irrigation is used then we have used multiple data set to to test our hypothesis one of the data set that we have used in this study is the standard cost cultural sample and also the ethnographic atlas well the SCCS data is a subset of uh, ethnographic atlas with more variables so we can control a large number of variables but the number of societies uh, are less so using this uh, data that gives us the latitude and longitude of these societies uh, and we draw a circle of 200 kilometers around these societies to find the irrigation potential and other geographical control then our empirical specification is uh, simple where we use uh, the sorry well probably there's some noise coming in okay so uh, using this specification our uh, result shows that irrigation potential is uh, indeed has a negative influence on female participation in overall agriculture that's column one to four here we have also control for like a major crop whether a prehistoric group was using a cereal crop or whether there was class stratification in the society well we use the cereal in particular because uh, it has been uh, argued in literature that uh, though cereal is good for uh, for stories, but at the same time, it needs for uh, before eating, it needs to be processed and it takes more time for cooking as well. And generally, this responsibility lies with the female uh, at the household. So we control for this variable as well. And the last column basically shows that female time and effort on subsistence acti activities. And all this uh, uh, recreation shows uh, a strong. Uh, association between the irrigation potential and uh, the female uh, roles whether it's in agriculture or uh, with other subsistence activities then we looked at the afro -barom barometer sample this is a sample of 34 african countries where uh, and from this uh, data set we can also identify what was the ethnicity of uh, the individuals who have been surveyed uh, because in this uh, data set they ask they ask for the ethnicity of uh, the individuals so and we use these uh, two sample questions one is uh, when jobs are scarce men should have more rights to a job than women basically that indicate uh, a kind of social bias in the society or not or with the individuals that they think that men should have more rights to job. And the second question from in the column five to eight, it uh, asks for women should have the same rights as men to own and inherit land, basically it's about the property rights. And when we uh, regress this uh, uh, with the, the irrigation potential, and in this case, the irrigation potential is for, uh, uh, for those, uh, is for the ethnic group where they were living historically. So as we can again see in the first four columns, the relationship is positive and significant. That's where you indicate that individuals who come from, from society where the irrigation potential uh, is high, they think that men should have more right for the jobs. Uh, and the column five to eight indicate basically that women have uh, the, these individuals think that women should have lesser property rights. And we have control for region and ethnicity uh, for standard error. So those things we have done and they are written in the paper as well. And uh, I don't know how much time I have. I think I still have another five minutes so I can discuss things okay. in detail. Okay. so. Then we looked at the cross-country sample as well. So I will basically just quickly uh, 
I'll just move forward. Okay, so this, then one of the methods that is basically used in literature is uh, when we're looking at particularly culture is we look at the immigrants because when immigrants move from one society or one country to another country, they leave behind the institutions. And when they're living in another country, they face the institutions of the country where they have, uh, they have immigrated. And uh, the only thing they take with them is their culture. So it isolates the impact of culture from institution. So we look at the immigrants, uh, the children of immigrants in USA, and in our paper, we have also looked at the immigrants into, into Europe, but this one is uh, important to highlight here because uh, using this uh, American Community Survey, we could identify the individuals who moved to US when they were young, basically they were under the age of six. And we call this 1.5 generation uh, immigrant, and we are using the female immigrants because they are not the first generation who moved to uh, let's say in this case us when they are already adult or the second generation who are born in us so these are the immigrants who were born outside usa but they immigrated to usa when they were they were very basically they were kids so uh, using this uh, sample um sorry i haven't put the table here so we, we found the similar results that uh, the people who have immigrated from the countries where the irrigation potential is high, this so that the females from th those communities are working less uh, in, in US as well, after controlling for all uh, state effect and the country effect and uh, all those things. And we have looked at a sample from India as well, where uh, this is basically a, a DHS uh, a survey. And the our results are still the same that uh, whichever sample we have used that uh, irrigation potential is negatively associated with the, the paid work or work outside the family. Then we have identified multiple mechanisms in this paper. One of them is warfare. The idea, as I discussed earlier at the beginning, that uh, the, the idea, as I discussed earlier, when you have any kind of infrastructure, then you need to protect it. And it can create a culture of war where uh, the people are protecting their uh, this uh, irrigation infrastructure or their storage at home, or they need to fight to get the ir ir irrigation for, for their field because the people who are, or the farmers who are upstream, they might block the water coming to their field. And it can eventually create a culture of warfare uh, in a society. And generally, male gets uh, more advantage when we are talking of war. Then, as we discussed uh, earlier, okay. So, as we discussed earlier, that uh, once the irrigation happens, females uh, are are forced to work at home, and so it creates uh, also a division of labor. Then uh, the they can be, as uh, I was discussing again earlier, when we have uh, uh, the higher irrigation, then, then the political system in those society can be autocratic and generally autocratic societies don't uh, uh, respect or promote the property rights. And uh, when the property rights are vulnerable, then the female will get, will get affected more and uh, it can we also look at the culture of individualism versus the collectivism in the society so we looked at these okay these mechanism and uh, as uh, we can see that uh, for example in column one it shows that with the irrigation potential we have more uh, external warfare so this is uh, a sample from the secs and Similar things have been repeated in column number four to six. When you look at the column number four, we've, and this is a sample for India, where we have uh, uh, we have looked at the war that has happened in last uh, almost hundred years, and we looked at the total number of wars that has happened uh, around a district, and then we 
So the result shows that where we had a higher irrigation potential, we have more external warfare, and that can our result shows that it can be it can explain uh, to a part of uh, why we we see this uh, gender inequality. Okay, and then the further results that I discussed for autocracy or for individualism and property rights. So it's, it gives the similar uh, expected results to what we have discussed. And this is uh, what uh, basically we have tested this hypothesis that female uh, non-domestic labor force participation in female property rights are negatively associated with ancestral irrigation agriculture. And we provide evidence from pre-industrial societies and uh, various other data sets and we propose various plausible mechanisms for effect of irrigation on female labor force participation and female property rights in this paper. So with this I, I will stop and so I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much Tatiandra. Perhaps if you can uh, exit the screen sharing then we can have everyone here okay. in the discussion uh, in, in, a, okay. yeah, in a more joined up form. Um, so there, there have been um, two comments and questions. Um, Junhyun Kim, would you like to, uh, I'm trying to find, would you like to sure. ask your question, please? Uh, sure, thank you. Well, hi, Satyendra. Well, thanks for hi. the nice, very interesting talk. This is Junyang Kim, you can call me Jun. Yeah, so I was wondering, the you know, story is plausible, mechanism is interesting, but it could have been that the already gender unequal communities who developed the gender inequality through some, perhaps through some other mechanism, decided mm -hmm. to settle in those lands, or may, maybe they had a stronger army and defeated whoever was already there, and that created the, this historical pattern. So can you or rule out or account for that possibility? Okay, so, well, explicitly we have not uh, tested this because uh, uh, the one of the problem is that we don't have uh, the gender inequality data from past. So uh, we can't explicitly test this with whether the gender inequality was already existent in the former societies or not that's uh, that is uh, one limitation but uh, we though we haven't tested it but we can argue that uh, the most of the prehistoric societies uh, basically they started with the hunter gathering and there are evidence that they were uh, probably less unequal so that's something we can look at but we haven't explicitly tested this thing Yes, that's a bit, that's a limitation at the moment. Okay, would you like to um, get into that discussion? Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's the same same thing that's, you know, that was mentioned by John, because they should, it, it seems like the paper is making this argument that, you know, this irrigation is the main thing uh, without really a kind of justifying that there is no, because there's a possibility that, like was mentioned before, there might have been other things. So there might be omitted variable bias here, or you know, in terms of controlling for reverse causality. Um, and it is, it's, uh, you know, the, the 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 argument seems to be that this is the only thing that determines the the, the gender inequality, which is a, a strong argument to make uh, if you can't if well, you can't test for other things. Well, uh, though I didn't see so most of the many results that we have in our paper, but uh, what we have done is uh, we have control for many other things. For example, in our cross, particularly in the cross section, uh, cross country results, for example, we have control for the plow use. We have looked for uh, the Neolithic revolution when it happened the number of years. So we have control for many other things in our, uh, in our robustness checks uh, that have been uh, proposed uh, in the earlier literature that they can create a gender inequality. Uh, so though I couldn't show all those results, but yes, uh, we have done uh, various robustness checks for other things uh, that are generally being argued can create uh, the gender inequality. I, I wonder though, it's your measure. It's not a measure of irrigation. 
your measure is a measure of potential for irrigation. So yes. um, actually, like, I don't know, I'm just thinking about June's question that uh, it, it's not that more unequal, gender unequal communities settled in well irrigated lands. If, if kind of following this in your setup, it would be if this was the case, they would have settled in actually less irrigated lands that would have benefited most from irrigation, right? So this is, this is like, um, um, I would see this measure as an instrument for irrigation or, or you know, something which, which is, I think it, 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 it's worth considering, but... Um, uh, yes. Well, we have also argued because we we understood this uh, limitation of rivers causality as uh, uh, I think both of them have both of them have highlighted earlier as well. Uh, basically, we discussed this thing in in uh, relation to the immigrants, particularly to the U.S. And our uh, argument is that uh, it is less likely that the people who, uh, for example, if there is a society that is unequal and they have higher irrigation, then it is, uh, we have argued that it is unlikely that the people or the male from that society will be moving out of the country or immigrating. So that's from the cultural perspective, we have argued uh, who will be the first to immigrate uh, if there is a gender bias in the country and they have a culture of, uh, and that comes because of irrigation. So to some extent we have argued but yes, still there can be a problem of selection bias. Uh, and yes, those are limitations at the moment. Thank you. Other questions? Please, Salman. Uh, thank you. I uh, read the paper, I think once or twice, and I wrote detailed comments for Satyandra. Uh, I am not sure how much of it is reflected in the current version that uh, he presented. It, but we, uh, I found the paper very interesting. Uh, there is a number of factors other than irrigation that could be uh, decisive for this gender role. Uh, for instance, irrigation because it leads to higher productivity in a different division of labor. But we have also uh, technology and education that in this even a stronger way leads to differences in productivity of labor and uh, they are not causing any kind of uh, uh, gender uh, inequality in role. Because if you look at developed countries that they have higher education, high technology, so still uh, women uh, has much stronger role than, than, than before. So that's why probably is a unique situation that we think uh, uh, irrigation, you can isolate the effects and it can lead to, uh, uh, has implication for gender role and also uh, property right. It would be interesting to look at, for instance, uh, uh, societies that they have irrigation, maybe irrigation is mixed with technology and education, like dropping irrigation. They use it in countries like Israel and uh, in societies that are uh, uh, that are like uh, rural societies. That could be interesting to see what is the role of women in those societies with strong technology, strong education, and irrigation plays a very important role in agriculture. Otherwise, the best factor that led to reduce this gap is basically is war. That's what happened in, in, in Europe, that women become liberated after the Second World War and the First and Second World War, they got into the job market and become, uh, they changed their role. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, we have worked on uh, various of your comments uh, in the latest draft, uh, but still a uh, few of them are still left and we are st okay. trying to find uh, some ways to incorporate them. So yeah, we are working on your comments, thanks. Thank you. Very interesting thank you. paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, thank you very much, Satyandra, for the presentation. Uh, and it's now time to pass the screen and microphone to Ellie.
Sally Hyde um, has worked with Professor Anurag Sharma on his GLOVERTIS project. Sally is PhD candidate at the University of Pittsburgh and he will be sharing the results of his work on the regressive costs of drinking water contaminant avoidance. Please, Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Nizalova, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, so as uh, she just mentioned, the title of my talk is The Regressive Costs of Drinking Water Contaminant Avoidance. And this is part of a broader research agenda on the distributional implications of environmental shocks. Really looking forward to any comments you may have on this. Between 9 and 45 million Americans are exposed to contaminated drinking water in any given year. The EPA enforces maximum contaminant levels, or MCLs for short, uh, for 83 different compounds with a variety of health effects. They can have cardiovascular consequences, uh, respiratory, uh, for the case of infants particularly, could be acute uh, health conditions or even death. Um, and these contaminants can enter the water through various sources, industrial processes, soil runoff uh, for some naturally occurring organic compounds, or improper treatment techniques at the water utility if there's uh, 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 excessively high residual disinfectant level, uh, that's another potential violation. Overall, regardless of what contaminant it is, uh, whenever these maximum levels are exceeded, the utility is required by law to inform their customers um, as soon as they can within two weeks of the uh, violation occurring through a, a test. And while those customers wait for the water supply to return to compliance, uh, they can purchase bottled water and filtration devices to avoid contaminants in the interim. And we know that they do this from existing literature in uh, economics, health economics generally. Uh, people increase their purchases of bottled water or things like filters, uh, water pitchers that you put in the fridge where you can filter out contaminants, maybe even lead, um, as a way of avoiding uh, those contaminants until the utility manages to remove them from the supply. But this cost looms larger for poorer households. So these costs don't scale with income. Uh, the cost of going to the store, unless there's a, a program in place to explicitly distribute bottled water and filtration devices to poor households, which is very uncommon, um, the price is the same for everyone. So if everyone has to purchase these devices to avoid, that's going to make up just mechanically a greater share of income and, and disposable income specifically for poorer households. For example, in, in Flint, Michigan, which is kind of a, a, a poster child for, for water issues in the United States this decade, uh, the state was spending $22,000 per day on a free bottled water distribution program to residents. That was an example where they actually did distribute water uh, for free to affected residents and the costs mounted very quickly. Uh, according to a, a market study covered in Business Insider, the average cost per gallon of bottled water was $1.22 in 2012. And this is skewed a bit upward by single bottles. Uh, so a lot of water purchasing in the United States is, you know, you, you go to the checkout line at the grocery store and you grab a single bottle of water out of the cooler there. And those are very, very expensive per gallon, up to $7.50 per gallon because of the convenience charge. If you remove those, it's a little bit more modest, but still relatively high uh, per gallon cost of 49 cents, especially when compared to tap water, which costs on average four tenths of a cent uh, per gallon. So anywhere from uh, about 100 to 300 times more expensive per gallon. Uh, for, as a, a way of putting some magnitude on this with the back of the envelope ca calculation, a uh, family profiled by CNN in 2016 in Flint, Michigan, was using 151 bottles per day for consumption, cooking, cleaning, all of that. Uh, that equals about 20 gallons, which is about $9.80 or uh, up to $24.40 if you use this uh, more skewed average per day. So very significant cost to the household, especially if that household is budget constrained. Overall, budget constrained households face a choice. 
they either risk exposure to the contaminants and save this money, um, allow them to dedicate this money to other things, nutritious foods, things like that, or they do purchase this avoidance. And as a result, they have to potentially forego other types of consumption. That gets me to my research question, which is how do the economic consequences of water quality violations differ by household income? And a secondary question to that, uh, in terms of a very specific potential economic consequence that I've hinted at a couple times, does poor quality water supply increase the risk of food insecurity among poor households? The first thing I'm going to show you is just the correlation between uh, food insecurity rates in the United States and the uh, prevalence of water quality violations since 2009. So, to define the data that I use to de uh, uh, define those measures. First, I have a panel of health-based water quality violations from the Environmental Protection Agency Safe Drinking Water Information System. And that spans from 2009, which is when this database started to be publicly available, to 2016. The definition of health-based is just any violation that's expected to have adverse health consequences for consumers either acutely or in the long term after long repeated exposure. Importantly, uh, this does not include monitoring and reporting violations. So in this data set, there are a lot of violations that just mean the utility didn't submit a test result by a particular deadline. In those cases, we don't necessarily know whether there's something wrong with the water or not. It could be just you know, bureaucratic failure to report the the violation, um, the water could be fine. So I restrict to only the cases where we absolutely know something is wrong with the water that needs to be rectified. This data set includes uh, both the date that the public notification was requested by regulators, which is required by law. There are fines attached to failing to notify affected customers, and then the date that compliance was ultimately achieved. And I characterize any violation between these two dates as active. These are essentially the start date and the end date of a particular water quality violation. Then to get a measure of uh, household expenditure, particularly on groceries and other nutritious foods, I have a panel of household purchases from the Nielsen Home Scan Consumer Panel, and that's from 2004 to 2016. This is a nationally representative panel with over 100,000 households in it in total about uh, the coverage is about 50,000 to 60,000 households per year. And importantly, it includes demographics on these households. I use the household size and the household income, both of which are reported in the panel to classify households as above or below 200% of the federal poverty line. This is my measure of whether or not that household is likely to be budget constrained in their grocery purchases. 200% of the federal poverty line is a common threshold used for means testing in, in food programs or similar cutoffs like 185% uh, around there. And finally, to get a measure of the nutritional value of these household grocery purchases, I have UPC level nutrition facts data from the USDA Food Data Central. So this associates with each uh, product code um, the barcode that you scan in order to check out a, a product at the grocery store. This has all of the information that you would see on the nutrition facts panel um, for that product, for products sold in the United States. This is a map of where these water quality violations are occurring at the county level. So a lot that's in this map is uh, echoing what was found in that PNAS paper by Ambora Allaire and co-authors. Uh, in particular, this area with uh, Texas is a very high concentration of water quality violations. The southern Midwest and the southwest um, are a real uh, hot spot in terms of water quality issues. And then you see some other hot spots uh, throughout Appalachia um, and in Florida as well. And for this map, so that you can see the variation, I top code uh, the number of violations at 20. So there are some counties in this sample that have as many violations in the sample period as 130. That's the maximum. Um, but just to make sure that you can see a smooth variation across counties, I, I top code this at, at 20. Then 
to kind of superimpose one map on another to show you the correlation spatially. This next map is the map of the food insecurity rate. So uh, this is the 2017 food insecurity rate from the uh, Mapping the Meal Gap project of Feeding America, um, one of the biggest charities in the US focused on hunger and food insecurity. And this is in quintiles. So you see the same areas in Texas particularly um, and the Southern Midwest that were hot spots for water quality violations are also hot spots for uh, this uh, food insecurity issue. And overall, uh, if I just do a, a naive correlation between these two measures, I find that one additional violation is correlated with a 1.4 percentage point uh, increase in the food insecurity rate. And this is a highly statistically significant correlation. But obviously this alone is not enough to determine causality. There are many reasons I'm sure you can imagine that these two things might be correlated. So my research question is essentially, is there an underlying causal relationship? Is this correlation, at least in part, uh, causal because of the downstream economic consequences of water quality violations? This is my empirical strategy. For each household, I calculate three measures, and these are going to be my three dependent variables. So I have the total expenditure per day that's reported to the panel. I have the calories purchased per household member per day as a measure of uh, how much these people are eating. And then uh, finally, avoidance, uh, that's purchases of bottled water, filtration devices, containers like you know, Brita pitchers and things like that as a share of overall expenditure for the household. Using these dependent variables, I have two complementary specifications. I have first a panel fixed effects regression uh, with an active violation indicator where active violation is defined, as I said before. <clears throat> and then I'm going to do an event study specification of the first recorded violation in the data. And I'll explain why uh, when I get to that. Ultimately, in each of these specifications, I'm going to be comparing the treatment effect for households below 200% of the federal poverty line to households above. 200% of the federal poverty line. So it's a difference in difference in, in that way, or even a triple difference if you consider the, the active violation uh, treatment variable. So I'll start with the panel fixed effect specification. This is just the regression model. Um, the energy is defined, as I said before, active violation in period uh, T for household I is a dummy variable that equals one if a community water system in the county of household I has a reported and unresolved health-based water quality violation in uh, month T and it's zero otherwise. Then below 200% federal poverty line is a dummy variable for that indicator as well. And note that I, I exclude the non-interaction term in this uh, textual representation of the model just because it's collinear with the household fixed effects. So that's differenced out by the, the household fixed effects. I include household year and month of year fixed effects in, in this regression to absorb both household level heterogeneity and, and time varying heterogeneity in these measures. Um, particularly, this is gonna pick up any uh, idiosyncratic differences in the panel over years because the panel is packaged yearly and the sample changes annually and all of that. So I definitely want to absorb any of those idiosyncratic uh, fixed time uh, variation. And finally, I restrict the sample to areas that experience at least one violation during the sample period. So you might think that uh, there, there's a selection in terms of where these water quality violations might happen. Maybe it's necessary for particular industries to be there or something. Um, and so I don't want to compare on the uh, extensive margin I'm comparing on the intensive margin of, of water quality violations or using the timing of those water quality violations as my shock. And this table shows the results of that specification. So in each case, a uh, highly statistically significant coefficient on the interaction between the active water quality violation and this measure of poverty. Uh, for avoidance, it's about uh, 28 hundredths of a, a percentage point. Uh, relative to a mean of about 60, uh, uh, 0.64 uh, percentage points, um, 0.65. I did put a little footnote there just to note that uh, many observations for that particular measure are zero. So it's a somewhat left skewed uh, distribution 
which explains maybe why this coefficient is, is on the smaller side. It's still statistically significant. So this first column confirms that these costs, as we expected mechanically, are looming larger for poor households as a share of their disposable income. Then the second is expenditure per day. And this differentially declines for poor households by about 24 cents per day. Or if I extrapolate that out to a month, it's about $7 per month. This is relative to a mean of about $12 per day uh, for households that are in this panel. So this suggests that uh, oh, sorry, you these... Have, uh, like one minute. I'm sorry. In, in oh, trouble. that's okay. Yes, please. Um, yes. So uh, then finally, for calories, I get a decline of about 50. Again, if I extrapolate that out to a month, it's about 1,500 per month, suggesting that uh, a way of thinking about that is that an average household member goes uh, potentially hungry for about one day in the month, uh, differentially relative to wealthier households. So I'll skip forward a little bit uh, for time. Uh, I run a panel uh, or uh, an event study uh, to answer some of these questions uh, that are not answered by the uh, panel fixed effects regressions. And uh, I'll skip those. These are just uh, specification uh, things about the event study and show you the graphs. So this is for avoidance. You see that after time zero, um, there is an increase in avoidance. Um, particularly around the sixth month of an active violation. So the longer these violations stretch out, uh, the more avoidance uh, ends up being purchased in this household. Um, this is for expenditure, same kind of thing. The effects accumulate the longer the violation lasts. Uh, so the, the strongest effects are really going to be for these drawn out violations that take a very long time to resolve for the water utility. And then finally for energy, again, same thing. Effects start to accumulate around month six um, and, and we see that decline graphically there. So uh, there are additional robustness checks I've run. I've done this at the zip code level instead of the county level, similar results. Um, but I do wanna be transparent about my limitations. So I don't know the specific water supplier of each household. So I know that a water supplier in an area was uh, affected by a water quality violation, but I don't know if it's that household water supply. So this is going to attenuate these estimates. Also, I have food purchased at restaurants is unfortunately not observed in this. Um, it's possible that households substitute toward fast food or something like that. Um, that's a limitation in, of the panel data set. And I may also underestimate avoidance expenditures if water filters are purchased at venues that don't enter my data. Just to conclude, during an active water quality violation, poorer household expenditure on grocery products differentially decreases by about $7 per month. But this is very likely an underestimate because this is an intent to treat where I, there's uncertainty as to whether or not the household is actually affected by these violations. Uh, calories purchased per household member per month declined by about 1,500, which is a large share of the daily recommended number of calories. And overall, these findings suggest that the indirect effects of water quality shocks through economic channels may contribute to food insecurity and poor nutritional outcomes. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kelly. If you could please stop sharing the screen so we can see. Uh, yes. Everyone. Thank okay. you very there much. We, um, we have two questions. I would hold on my questions for later. Um, Alfonso Flores okay. Lagunas, could you? Um, Yes, yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Very, very interesting uh, presentation and, and, and topic. Thank you. Um, so the, the question that I have is uh, that uh, um, I am not sure if you're able to control for household size because uh, due to hardship, the size of the households, particularly poor households, might vary over time. And I don't know how that might uh, be also impacted by the water quality issues, et cetera. Yes, um, so I do have uh, those demographics in the panel are updated on an annual basis. Um, so I would observe uh, with a little bit of a delay, unfortunately, um, if I wouldn't observe the exact month that a, an additional household member joined. Um, but I could look at, at heterogeneity by that uh, at the annual level. Um, it, yeah, I, I think that's going to be relevant, particularly because that's the denominator of, of a lot of my uh, 
dependent variables. So yeah, I can I can definitely look into that. Thanks. And a quick suggestion, if I if I may, uh, something that mm -hmm. appears to me would be very interesting is to look at the heterogeneity by race and ethnicity. Uh, for several reasons, poverty rates, food insecurity, exposure varies by in, in that uh, dimension, and also household size and so on, location as well. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Um, so I, I have done actually for a different paper some analysis of of the different incidents uh, by race and and definitely pulled in some of the environmental justice literature um, that there definitely is a, a disproportionate incidence of, of these um, water quality violations by race, by socioeconomic status. Um, and I do have that information as well, at least for the heads of household. I have the uh, race of the uh, both male and female heads of household if, if uh, each one of those is, is present. So I could look at that as well. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions? Well, maybe I can ask. Oh, please, Almas. <laughs> Sorry, you go first. <laughs> no, no, please. So my question was, uh, it would be interesting to use instead of uh, this dummy variable for uh, poverty line, to use uh, relative to mean or median of a smaller group. So it means you allow for variation in this poverty line by location. And uh, that gives you much more inform informative estimates than uh, using a dummy variable. Right, so essentially like a cost of living adjustment sort of thing or? Yes, because price develops differently from one location to another. Yes, yeah, definitely. I definitely want to pull in more um, information about prices into this. Mm -hmm. That's uh, I've also received a, a kind of similar suggestion uh, looking at whether or not these effects could be partly driven by price variation for the avoidance. Um, if there's a, a major demand shock uh, to avoidance, then we might see an explosion in prices of bottled water or something like that. Um, but yeah, so I can say overall that um, on a, a national level, these water quality violations, and you can kind of see it from the map if you like know where these areas are, um, they disproportionately occur in rural low income areas, um, which is kind of interesting because a lot of the environmental literature on air pollution is the opposite, where air pollution is typically more of an urban phenomenon, whereas water pollution is more of a rural, low population density, uh, low income phenomenon. But there are definitely exceptions to that, um, where you know there, even here in Pittsburgh, um, we had a major issue with lead um, about a couple of years after Flint. Um, and yeah, it. it would be informative to uh, there are definitely areas of Pittsburgh where the average income is is significantly higher um, than the the national average. So thank you. I think my question is a bit related to Almas, but in a different mm -hmm. way. Uh, also about geography, basically. So I just wondered whether uh, you know the the likelihood of uh, the violation occurring depends on the region and therefore other geographic things that may have an impact on uh, you know climate things climate characteristics which may so i, I was just thinking maybe if di did you control for for geography for region because that might have addressed both uh, our questions i think um, so I do have the, the household fixed effects in there, and I do uh, restrict the sample to only households that remain in the same location over uh, the panel, because I, I was a bit concerned about the possibility of moving, um, differential moving out of areas uh, that experience the water quality violations. Um, so I, I guess to some extent the the geography would calling for that to some extent yeah 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 that would be absorbed partially by the household fixed effects yeah. um yeah but i think uh and that's that's a comment that i've received 
also um, pulling in more about like why these violations happen in the first place um, as a potential way of explaining um, if there are any, because I, I have this effect that I estimate of, of decreasing expenditure, but it's uh, the mechanism remains to, to be found. Like what exactly is happening? Is it all avoidance? Is, are there maybe labor market dynamics uh, that are happening um, if, you know, maybe a water quality violation occurs and a plant is closed because they're polluting too much and they're fined and then everybody gets laid off, you know, something like that. Um, and that's, that's all uh, work that I'm, I'm planning to do in the future. I definitely want to look more into, into that. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank to all the participants um, for coming and um, participating in this webinar. Uh, if you have any further questions to Kelly or Satyendra or um, others about the JLO Virtus program, about the project, please, um, you can find our details on the website and please contact us. And the recording from this meeting, uh, from this webinar will be posted online. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.